I think our situation's a little bit different than what everybody else, <laughs> you know, I think if the main goal is to figure out something how to um, educate or integrate your child within the community, which it just happens because he's, he's there and, you know, we have a very small school district. <clears throat> he's always been integrated in the classroom. Um, this is his first chance to be with kids who are like him. So, you know, to me, this is, it's kind of a backwards thing. So I have always been advocating for him at having to do a lot of educating the people who are even in our school district and, you know, technically we're the first kid who had a diagnosis of autism in Door County, which to me is ridiculous, but it's true. And so a lot of programs have developed because of him and then other kids came out of the woodwork and now there's a huge community of families with autism in Door County. Um, and that's just in the last 10, 12 years. So, but, um, you know, I, I feel like I've, I've spent a lot of time in the classroom as far as uh, talking to other kids, you know, and um, explaining what autism is about and why Finn does certain things. And one time he did a, I went in there with him and he did a demonstration of all of his OT equipment. And I mean, that was like the biggest hit you could imagine because all the kids wanted to do, you know, the squeeze machine and all this stuff. So um, he's, he's always had a little bit of uh, a special place just because he's the only one, you know. Um, I've written articles for our local paper and, you know, I think we're pretty open so people ask us questions all the time. Um, I would really, I would like to be in a position where I could help other parents at IEP meetings um, because there's just so much rigmarole that you have to go through and um, but it, right now I mean after he was diagnosed when he was three he's 15 and um, this is like the best year I mean I feel like I don't have to reinvent the wheel <laughs> this year <laughs> which is so nice because they're actually like here's what we're gonna do because he's going through transition stuff and um, I feel like I'm learning from some of the people who are running the program and which is a real breath of fresh air. So, um, you know, I thought about, I have a lot of material for a book, but um, I think it, my, I feel like the, what's gotten us through most of this is having a sense of humor because Finn is hilarious and ridiculous and way out there you know i mean he says things to people that i mean he just he just walked down the aisle i love you oliver and sherry garcia <laughs> you know <laughs> and he talks about he talks about so many people here when he's at home i love them i want to play i want to be by them and you know um so he is he's very he's he's very social which is kind of unusual. He's more social than we are. So he, he advocates for himself a lot, actually, in our community. Um, but I really would like to, uh, you know, put together some sort of a book that uh, talks about all the craziness. And, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of hard stuff, but there's a lot of really, really funny, funny things, you know, along the way. And I think to have a kid with autism, most parents have a pretty whacked sense of humor. So anyway, um, we just continue to, I feel like I don't have to do as much or Jeff doesn't have to do as much in the community because Finn is already out there. So 
There's so many people that always come up and ask me, you know, well, how do you know how to do this and how do you know how to do this and what can we do and where do we start and things like that. There's so many people that are so lost with all this. They just, and if they don't have somebody guiding them to find out how they do it, they don't do it. So my community action plan would also be to, you know, help people in the community. Um, you know, I see a lot of people at the CP Center where Austin goes to swim, and, um, you know, some of those people really, they don't know what they're doing there. And sometimes, and, and I don't want to say anything bad about the CP Center, but I think sometimes there's not the people there to give them the directions, unless they would ask them to give them the directions. <coughs> so I think just being out there in general. Um, I work for an elementary school. Um, I see a lot of kids there that, you know, if, you know, parents would come up and ask me, you know, kids with special needs, you know, how's my child doing or whatever, and, you know, we'll talk for a little bit, and, you know, I'm always willing to share my experiences, you know, about my son as well, so I think just getting out there and doing it. A church member came up to me and asked me if I would be interested in getting together with a group coming in to the church called Bethesda, and it's a church group that comes in, they're involved in, I think, Fox Valley, and they have a home and a community area for kids with needs, adult, young adults with special needs, and um, transportation issues. So we have our first meeting April 20th, and we're just going to get the church involved first, and then the community, if it keeps growing, and eventually our pastor would like to get a home for these young adults and um, having someone staying there full time. Like Austin would be, he's comfortable around the kids, mm -hmm. but as they get older, what happens to them? That's right. my my main right. concern right. because I'm yeah. pretty old. And what happens to Austin when I'm gone? Right. And our good government, I, and I shouldn't say it that way, I'm real political charge, but <laughs> real bad. <laughs> but, you know, the support you get from the government isn't enough for an apartment, let alone food or anything else, plus transportation. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you put all of these things together, it, and it doesn't occur to you unless you have a child that has those needs, mm -hmm. you get ugly about it <coughs> because you can be, you know, you, you could be an immigrant and have a lot better time. So I'm, I'm very charged about what happens with special needs kids. And the thought of having a large facility where they can all live, mm -hmm. where they, you know, every special needs kid is good at something. Right. And those kids that have a little higher degree of skill would be able to augment the house, where the kid that doesn't have the skills would still have a comfortable home. Right. And the thought of being able to have a, a, you know, a, a larger place where they could work, they could all put in to the till and be independent. How you do it, I have no idea. Right. <laughs> Can you do it with government? I don't think so. Because they use it and give it to somebody else. But there's got to be some way of being able, you know, to have the child and have him in a comfortable environment and being able to use what he has from the government as part of something that would be more comfortable for them. For them. Mm -hmm. Our son is 20 years old and we've gone through a guardianship and uh, we're on the process of looking for work and housing and um, there really wasn't a central area where you could find out the information about all these different services and the people who you need to talk to and when do you do this and how do you do that. Um, all these services only represent themselves. They don't tell you that, you know, maybe you should go talk to this other one too. So we decided to start a uh, website for our community that will have uh, a centralized listing of all the different services and a little timeline as to how you need to get things going. And, uh, <clears throat> and then kind of like a frequently asked questions, you know, like what do all of these acronyms mean and things like that. So. Yeah, and part of the reason why I came here too, we've, 
we've got a great school system and teachers that are trying to help and they have a lot of these transition fairs. We go to them every year. We come home with bags of pamphlets and by the time we leave our head is spinning we just there's just too much information so we kind of, like Tom said we created like a little guide that kind of walks you through when you're 16 when you're 17 these are the steps you need to do and we're working with the teacher too she's going to try to when they have IEPs with the parents she's going to try to push them and say okay, when your child's this age, these are the steps you need to take as well. I'm more factual. I like, if I have a piece of paper in front of me, you know, I had to have my community action plan, something where I could touch it. I couldn't, it couldn't be just real abstract. So basically I was thinking, we have the Yippee website that you guys have, the Facebook, and all that information, and we were just getting pieces from everywhere. Mark's a teacher, so we always get emails. And so basically our, action plan involves our school district. We are going to, we've gotten permission to set up a table outside the library um, during summer school for five weeks. And we're gonna take just any information we can gather on support groups, um, Wisconsin SIBs, we've approached them, um, Fox Valley Autism Society, so any papers. And I've also reached out to some of the parents in the school district that if they have any items that they may see fish through, that they are welcome to join the table too. So um, pretty much just putting out there, there's so much stuff that we've gotten in this packet, this backpack that I can't even, you know, sort through. There's just so much stuff. And it's a shame because we didn't know anything about guardianship or especially a special needs trust. That's kind of our thing. Um, my son's 17. So we're ready. We're, we don't know where to go until we came here. And if we, probably wouldn't, we still wouldn't know where to go and would have been struggling more when it was 17 and a half and trying to, to get that. But so basically our action plan is putting it out there for the other members of our school district to share because when Cody started Freedom, he was um, like three, four years old in that preschool program and I had nowhere to go. And I, I still almost feel like we um, got more out here than we did actually, you know, from uh, information of support groups and stuff so I mean why not share it with someone who's just getting their diagnosis I guess my community action plan is kind of like in the works and it's a continuing project um, I have been working with Wisconsin Promise and then um, another person from Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin on community conversations about integrating kids with disabilities into the workplace um, so I kind of was on the ground floor with Molly um, as far as who to contact and the people that, you know, should be at a conversation like that. The conversation was actually just last week um, at the Croc Center um, to just try to get awareness out there to different employers and just, I think, people that don't know people with special needs as far as, you know, there's such a, I think unwritten spot like where people with disabilities work at you see them at goodwill or you see that token person at with disabilities at mcdonald's or you know and i think that with my son dante he doesn't look like he has a disability and he is capable of so much um, and so are all of our kids here and i think that that's what's really important is that i really want to raise the awareness for that um, and get these employers to realize kind of what they have in these kids you know um, Dante started working at Anduzi's through his school um, and they actually asked him to work during the summer which they don't have to do and so it's kind of a big deal um, for all of us and um, I just talked with a Wisconsin Promise and I think they are going to have um, it's called bring a legislator to work day and so Dante is hopefully going to be bringing I don't know which legislator, um, to Anduzi's um, and hopefully kind of just raising awareness um, to kind of let everybody know what these kids are capable of. And, you know, we're hoping that this is something that Dante continue with for as long as that's what he wants to do. Um, and I think I forget a lot of times because he is capable of so much stuff. Um, and for him, he kind of flies under the radar. Like I he's like, I don't think anyone knows I have a disability here. So he's a little 
um, nervous to let everyone know, like, I, I have a disability. I can't read, you know, very well, and I can't do all of these things because they see all the things he can do. Um, so it's really kind of my push with Dante to help him advocate as well for himself and for other people like him because he can do all of these things. Um, and it's not something to be embarrassed of or to hide from people, but to just say, maybe I can't do this well, but I sure can, you know, do everything else you tell me to do. Um, and so I guess that's kind of my plan is just to continue doing what they, you know, ask Dante and I to do to get that awareness out there and hopefully get other employers. He worked at um, Quick Trip as well. Um, and I think they're kind of on board on taking more kids from Bayport to work through that program. And now Anduzi's is on board and just to kind of see what other um, employers we can get involved in this. You know, we didn't know anything about Yippy. We weren't being told the information at school. We should have been because some of the people that are part of Yippie are part of our school district. We heard about it through Special Olympics program um, where some of the other parents and families have their kids and talking to those parents, they're the ones that told me, oh, Yippie, Yippie. And I'm like, okay, what is Yippie? You know, and so then they were able to explain it to me and I called and got on the, the schedule for this term, which is outstanding. And um, really I've gotten so much information in one place here through this program, then it would have taken me years to get other ways, you know? And it's just like, there is that disconnect um, with school, uh, with some of the other services that are available. You're not getting the full story of what happens as your child ages. And I had some idea, I knew 18, at 18 things were gonna change, but I didn't quite understand how much they were gonna change and how quickly it changed. I mean, right then at their birthday, everything changes. So if you're not ready for it, you have a problem. And so I was ready for it and we were ready for it. And uh, we ended up getting our special needs trust you know, in place. So we ended up getting the guardianship done in time and really felt prepared, but we were prepared because of what we've learned here at Yippie. So it's been wonderful for our family, For all of the reasons. Um, my community or our community action plan is related to employment as well because now that she's 18 and she'll be graduating in a year perhaps, we're not quite sure on that, it's, we're hoping for her input. Um, we went down to DVR and started that whole, you know, ball rolling and initially they said, oh, there's no waiting period. Well, I'll let you know, there is a waiting period. We haven't heard back from them and it's almost 60 days. So, you know, there's always that, that wait, which I think all of us are used to. Um, so whether you're waiting for a medical appointment, you're waiting for other type of service appointments, you're always gonna be waiting. And anyway, so our, we have kind of a Northeast Wisconsin community-based employment plan um, because we know that you're kind of stuck in a catch-22. The Project Search, which has just come to our area, which is a wonderful program Aspiro is in, in charge of. Somebody came here and talked about it last session. And, um, you know, we were very excited about that. We got our paperwork in. We really thought she would be a good candidate for that. But come to find out, um, she's too young, even at 18. And they, they basically want the kids to have more volunteer hours before they can be part of that program. Well, trying to get a place to volunteer is very difficult for our kids. Anybody who has any type of disability, very hard to do that. And you're supposed to be 18 to volunteer in a lot of places too, so you can't have that done before you actually have your birthday. So there's, you know, all this catch 22. Um, and then, you know, trying to find a job for her is really our, our next step. And because it's been such a challenge for us, we really kind of can see now how it impacts everybody here and trying to get those opportunities to open up, like Katie had explained, I think is huge and it's, it's just critical. Um, and people don't understand the different levels fun of high functioning kids with autism, you know, versus there are some lower functioning people. So you've got all these people who are out there willing to work and would be very dedicated employees once they learn the, the task um, that aren't being tapped or utilized because you know, they have a disability. And I think that um, people need to open their minds. The employers need to open their minds. And I think that the, the educators, everybody needs to collectively unite to come together to let people know. I mean, it's really about awareness, what these kids are capable of doing. And then opening those doors. And once they're open, 
keeping the flow going, keeping it moving forward in a positive direction. Ours is a little bit different in this aspect that um, not finding, <clears throat> just finding employment for um, children with disabilities, but different professions that they might be interested in. So we've been in contact with various uh, manufacturers, um, uh, different companies, and bringing, um, at least from our, our school district, those kids into the, um, those facilities, meeting with the various departments of uh, those people. So they get an idea of, oh, that's an office job, or that's a manufacturing job, oh, that's how um, a forklift operator, um, or this is a, a designer, or a, somebody that um, does AutoCAD work or SolidWorks. Um, they're very open then to um, let the students ask questions. You know, how'd you start out? What kind of education? Um, because I think a lot of our kids are um, have those questions, and they just want those answers. Like, I don't know if I can do that because I'm not good at math. I'm not good at reading. Um, so they want that uh, that reassurance that you don't need, you know, a four-year degree to do that type of job. Um, so <clears throat> I did take a, a group of um, kids from Denmark through uh, where I work. Um, it's about six kids, and we went through the whole facility. We shared schooling, um, potential wages with them, um, those kind of things. Um, so schooling or school is kind of such a small part of everyone's life that um, you know, we, unfortunately, we work most of our lives. Um, that we felt that this kind of a, a good step for you know those kids with disabilities um, and then out of it um, um, after I think maybe a week or so um, Becky um, Evan Becky emailed me um, and Evan was interested in my particular job so we actually had he had a kind of a mock interview with me and then also um, he had some very good questions but it was I think more experience for him of um, how do I go to an interview? What kind of questions do I ask? And those kind of things. So I think it was a good, um, a good process all around. So.